So, up next, Matt, Matt Pearson, uh, currently and formerly of Reed, um, and formerly of UCLA. Um, serial monogamist conlanger, um, by self-description, if I may quote you. Um, and, in fact, a uh, published professional conlanger of Hollywood. Uh, so we've got a, a hog, a little bit of a star. To end our talk, a little bit of glamour. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so, as uh, as most, if not all, of you know, uh, the languages of the world distinguish argument relations or uh, syntactic functions, whatever you want to call it. If you're looking through the for uh, the handout, yeah, it's not in the booklet. There's a separate handout on the back on the back table. Um, uh, the languages of the world uh, distinguish syntactic relations like subject and object in one of three ways, either by using word order, by using case marking, or by using agreement, or most typically by using some combination of, of those with maybe one of the three strategies dominating. So in English, for example, we primarily use word order to distinguish subjects from objects, but we also have a little bit of case marking in the form of uh, the different pronoun forms and a teeny little bit of agreement, uh, uh, sort of residually in English. Um, what I want to talk about here mostly is uh, different kinds of case patterns, uh, and in particular the way in which case marking interacts with event structure. Uh, and there's two parts to this talk. There's a sort of linguistic, typological portion of the talk, where I go through some examples from different languages. For those of you who have a lot of linguistics, this will all be reviewed but uh, hopefully I can come up with some cool examples that maybe you haven't seen before. Uh, and then the second half of the talk is sort of, shall we say, autobiographical. Um, uh, I'm going to report to you on my uh, investigations into uh, incorporating uh, weird kinds of case marking phenomena into my conlang, Tokana, um, and sort of show you what I've come up with and what I think is interesting about it. Um, all right, so let's start. So, as most of you know, uh, probably, the languages of the world tend to favor one of two main patterns that we call nominative accusative and ergative absolutive, or accusative and ergative for short. Um, in a accusative pattern, uh, transitive and intransitive subjects are marked the same way, and transitive objects are marked in a different way. Uh, so I've given an example of a classic accusative language at number one on the handout. This is Quechua. Uh, so you see I've got an intransitive sentence in 1A and a transitive sentence in 1B. In 1A, the subject, Juan, is marked with nominative case, which in this case is, is not atypical uh, by the absence of a suffix. Uh, in 1B, you see that the transitive subject is uh, also marked by the absence of a suffix, whereas the direct object, Pedro, has a, an accusative suffix on it. Uh, that's by far the most common pattern, but a healthy minority of the world's languages show uh, an ergative pattern instead, as in two, these examples are from Yidin, uh, an Australian language. Um, so here you see that the intransitive subject in 2a, Mujang, uh, is marked the same way as the object of the transitive verb in 2b, uh, whereas the subject, uh, Wagal, is marked differently uh, with uh, what we call the ergative case mark. Uh, so this is sort of the bare minimum that everybody knows about uh, the, the, K, the variety of case systems of the world. Um, many of you will also be aware that um, uh, many of the world's languages uh, show both of these two patterns uh, in different contexts, uh, what we call ergativity splits, uh, suggesting that uh, ergativity and accusativity are perhaps best thought of not as properties of languages, but as properties of constructions within languages or domains within the syntax of different languages. Uh, there are all kinds of ergativity splits. Here's one of the more common kinds, illustrated in three. This is some data from Georgian. Uh, so in Georgian, uh, uh, sentences in the uh, non-past tense uh, are marked according to a nominative accusative pattern, whereas those in the past tense are marked according to an ergative pattern. So in 3a and 3b, I give uh, some intransitive sentences, and you see that the subjects mark the same way in both cases. Uh, so we've got a present tense verb in 3a and a past tense verb in 3b. In C, 
see in D, you see the past tense, uh, some past tense, uh, present and past tense transitive sentences. And you see that in 3C, uh, we have, uh, well, it's a nominative accusative pattern, although in Georgian, uh, uh, direct objects of transitive verbs are actually marked with dative case rather than um, accusative case. Um, but we get the same marking for the transitive subject as we do for the intransitive subjects in A and B. But then if you look at the sentence in D, which differs from C only in the tense on the verb, you see that here it's the uh, direct object that's getting the nominative slash absolutive marking and the subject is marked with ergative case. Uh, okay, so that's fairly well known. If you know anything about ergativity, you've seen examples like this before. A little bit less well known is the fact that in ditransitive predicates, that is those that take two objects, let's call them the theme and the recipient. So I gave the book to John, the book is the theme, and John is the recipient there. Uh, in ditransitive predicates, we again find uh, various uh, types of categories, various alignments. The most common being uh, the direct indirect object uh, pattern uh, that's illustrated in four for Japanese. So here, when you've got a, a what I'll call a monotransitive sentence, that is one with only one direct object, uh, it gets accusative marking. In a ditransitive sentence like 4b, uh, the theme gets the same marking as the object of the monotransitive sentence, namely accusative marking. And you've got a separate case form, the dative, for the indirect object. Okay, so that's a fairly well-known pattern. But you also find languages that show uh, what's called a primary secondary object pattern, uh, as in 5. The examples in 5 are from a language called Kokborok, which I think is a wonderful name for a language. It sounds like a con line to me. <laughs> Kokborok is spoken in India. Uh, and if you compare 5a and b, so look at 5b first. Here we've got something that's very similar to the Japanese. We've got um, a dative marking on the indirect objects that give the tree water. Uh, but you notice that in 5a, uh, here we have a monotransitive verb, and the direct object is getting dative marking again. So here, uh, direct objects of monotransitive verbs are marked the same way as recipients of um, ditransitive verbs. And then the theme in a ditransitive verb is marked differently, in the case of Kokoro, by the absence of the subjects. And as with ergativity and accusativity, many languages show both patterns. So uh, you could argue that languages with dative shifts like English exhibit both kinds of pattern, um, uh, direct, indirect, and primary, secondary. I won't go into that too much. Uh, okay, now people like Bernard Comrie and others have suggested that the primary function of case marking is to discriminate the arguments of a verb, right? So to be able to tell the subject from the object, to tell who's doing what to whom. Okay? Um, however, a number of linguists, uh, I list here Hopper and Thompson, but uh, there are tons of others who have worked on this idea, have shown that case marking uh, can be deputized to express other kinds of uh, grammatical features or other kinds of grammatical patterns in addition to merely distinguishing who is doing what to whom. So uh, uh, in split ergative languages of the Georgian type, for example, the case marking is not only allowing you to tell which noun phrase is the subject and which is the object in the transitive clause, but it's also helping to mark the tense of the clause. Um, now, there are a number of different factors that uh, can uh, uh, come into play in terms of determining what kinds of case marking systems languages are going to have. So I want to review a few of these and then show sort of how I've incorporated some of this into Tokana. Okay, so I'll start with animacy or volitionality of the subject. Um, so languages often reserve their prototypical strategy for encoding transitive subjects for subjects that are very high in agenthood, that are very agentive. That is, uh, subjects that are um, maybe high in animacy, uh, that are volitional, that are understood to be initiating some action that is external to the participant itself. Um, for example, in, in many languages, it's common that um, transitive, the typical transitive subject marking is reserved only for verbs uh, where the subject is high in agency. And I've give, given some examples here from Waimi, the Egyptian language of Central America in six. So the normal way of marking subjects 
in past tense clauses in Guaymi is by uh, adding ergative marking. Uh, so we have Tomagwe Dori Demaini Tom Rita Doris. And you see that uh, with certain intransitive verbs, you also get ergative marking on the subject. But ergative marking is restricted to subjects that are high in volitionality. So in C, the dog died. You know, the dog doesn't have any say in the matter. Typically, I think this means the dog committed suicide. Um, and here we don't get ergative marking. Uh, and then if you look at D and E, uh, so here we've got verbs C and be afraid of that are again don't really involve any agency on the part of the subject. I mean, you, you can see things without um, having any say in the matter. You can be afraid of things, and it's, it's not really by your own volition. And you'll notice that here the subjects don't get ergative marking either. They get um, some sort of oblique marking. So uh, C takes a dative subject in D, and in E we see that uh, feel fear takes a locative subject. It says, it's a, in David is fear of Doris, something like that. Uh, a rather striking example, I think, of the relationship between animacy and case marking comes from uh, this Papuan language, Dani, that I give some examples of in 7. Uh, in Dani, in typically, both transitive subjects and objects are unmarked. They don't get any case marking at all. There, there's some agreement on the verb. But just in case the subject is less animate than the direct object, uh, you'll get a special marking on the subject to indicate, you know, contrary to expectations, um, this is the subject and not the other thing in the clause, right? So, um, uh, and in Dani, like in, in most languages that have animacy hierarchies, humans are more animate than animals, for whatever reason. Um, and so, in 7, you see that uh, when a, a person is eating an animal, uh, neither the person nor the animal gets marking, but when the animal is eating the person, um, the animal gets ergative marking to show that I am a less foolish, I am a less animate subject acting on a more animate object. One could argue that a python eating a person is more typical than a person eating a python, but so it's, it's done based on animus. Um, many languages uh, divide their intransitive predicates into two classes based roughly on things like volitionality or inventiveness. Uh, so subjects of intransitive verbs that are highly volitional will tend to get marked the same way as subjects of transitive verbs, whereas subjects of intransitive verbs that are low in volitionality will tend to get marked like objects of transitive verbs. And I have a, a, an example of that phenomenon from this language, Laz, Turkey. Um, so you see in 9 that Laz is an ergative language. Um, uh, so transitive subjects are marked for ergative case. Uh, if you compare 9b and c, you'll see that intransitive subjects sometimes get ergative case and sometimes get no case. Uh, they get ergative case when the verb describes some uh, action that is sort of more under the control of the subject of the intransitive, like crying. Um, whereas staying in the house is sort of less adjective, you know, just sort of saying that the individual is in a particular location, so you don't get any ergative work. Another thing that uh, case marking uh, can depend on in various different types of languages is different facts about the event status of the clause. Um, uh, either what kind of event it denotes or what sort of temporal or aspectual viewpoint from which the event is regarded. Uh, so things like eventivity, telicity, punctuality, perfectivity can all play a role in case marking. And I gloss these terms uh, briefly here. So, we can distinguish between predicates that are stative, so they denote a property or a state, from ones that are eventive, where there's some sort of change involved or, or some sort of activity. Among eventive predicates, we can distinguish between ones that are telic and ones that are atelic. This is going to be an important distinction for me later on. Um, so an event is telic if it's got an end point. That is, if the event necessarily terminates once you reach a certain point. So, uh, say, uh, eat the apple is a telic event because the apple the, the event necessarily ends once the apple is consumed. Right? Whereas push the cart is an atelic event because it's it's open ended. Right? You, you, there's uh, uh, there's no limit to how long you can push a cart. Um, okay, and then among.
from telic events, those that have uh, uh, an endpoint, we can distinguish between punctual and non-punctual ones. So a punctual event is one that's conceived of as being instantaneous. So say, uh, the bomb exploded, or the man reached the summit. Uh, these are viewed as sort of instantaneous changes of state. Whereas non-punctual events are ones where there's some buildup to uh, the change of state that's involved. So say, build a house is a non-punctual And then as far as perfected versus imperfected, so this is how, this is sort of all about the uh, vantage point from which an event is viewed. Um, so uh, a clause is perfected if the event is sort of viewed after the fact um, as, as sort of a coherent whole. So the, the, the viewpoint from which the event is viewed is, is after the event terminates. Whereas something is imperfected if it's viewed as being ongoing if the, the viewpoint is sort of within the event prior to the termination of the event. Um, okay, so that last category plays a role in case marking in Finnish, for example. Uh, I know a lot of conlangers are fans of Finnish. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sure that more than one person in this room knows a little bit about accusative versus partitive marking in Finnish. Uh, direct objects in Finnish can take either accusative case, which is usually homogenous with tentative, or a partitive case. Sometimes they take the a case, but I won't go into that. Um, and there are a bunch of different factors that determine whether you use accusative case or whether you use partitive case. Um, and one of the factors has to do with the viewpoint from which the event is, is viewed. So uh, accusative case tends to be preferred if uh, the event is perfective, if the clause is perfective, whereas partitive case tends to be preferred if the event is imperfective. This is all else being equal, and of course all else is not equal, but uh, at least uh, there are certain kinds of sentences where you can tease tease this, uh, tease this the aspect reading out of some other things. So if you look at 10 A and B, you'll see that these sentences are identical, except that uh, the direct object, the letter, is getting accusative case in 10 A and a partitive case in 10 B. And in both cases, it's understood to be, there's a particular letter you're referring to, but it's indefinite, so new to the discourse and so on. Uh, and notice that the form of the verb isn't different. Um, but sentence 10a is interpreted perfectively, whereas 10b is interpreted imperfectively. The, the event is understood to be ongoing at the, at the moment in question. So the businessman wrote a letter versus was writing a letter. Um, uh, sort of anticipating my uh, the, the discussion to follow, uh, I think the difference has to do with whether the direct object is completely affected by the action or not at the point at which, from which the event is viewed. So in an ongoing event, the, the letter hasn't been completely written yet, it's sort of in progress. And, uh, and, and so there isn't a complete letter yet, and that's why the partitive reading is used. You can, you can paraphrase this, the businessman wrote part of a letter. And one of the natural interpretations of that is that he was in the process of writing. Uh, whereas in 10a, with the accusative case, that suggests that the direct object is completely affected by the action. In this case, it is completely, it has come completely into existence. Right? So the, the, the letter is all there. Um, okay, and I also give an example from Samoa, and this is a, a somewhat different kind of example, uh, but it also shows, I think, the interaction between case marking and event structure. So. Uh, you look at the two sentences and you see that they've got the same verb root, manantu, meaning to think. Uh, in 10a, though, we've got what looks like an intransitive construction, a formally intransitive construction, where the person doing the thinking is in uh, unmarked case, absolutive case in this language, and the thing being thought about is in the uh, oblique case, uh, as marked by that little particle. Uh, whereas in 11b, the sentence is formally transitive. You've got a special little suffix on the verb that indicates I am transitive. <laughs> and um, notice that here the thing being thought about is uh, showing up in absolutive case, and the one doing the thinking is showing up in regative case. So this is patterning like a standard transitive sentence. And you notice how they differ in interpretation. So in, in both cases, they refer to an event whereby uh, let's say, uh, the image or idea of some person comes into the mind of some other person. Right? But in 11a, 
the event is understood as non-punctual, right? You can think about somebody for a, an indefinite period of time, and there's sort of no sense of a change of state involved. This is just sort of a, uh, a property that the boy had, or an activity that the boy was engaged in. Whereas in 11b, the gloss is the boy remembered the girl. So here there's, there's a sense of an instantaneous change of state. The, the girl was not in the boy's mind, and then suddenly she was in the boy's mind. So that, that's an example of case marking being affected by, in this case, the punctuality of the event rather than the aspect of the event. Okay, moving on to 2.3. So um, in many languages, uh, direct objects, um, direct object marking is reserved for situations where the direct object is highly individuated in some way. That is, uh, where the direct object is definite rather than indefinite, or where it's specific or referential rather than generic or non-specific, uh, or where it's high in animacy. Right? And sometimes these factors interact with each other. Um, I give some classic cases from Turkish and Hebrew in 12 and 13. So in 12, uh, so Turkish and Hebrew are both nominative accusative languages. But in these languages, accusative case is reserved for definite or specific direct objects. And indefinite or non-specific direct objects are just unmarked, so they're formally identical to nominative case. Uh, so in 12, A and B, uh, here the difference is one of specificity. Uh, so, the, so in both sentences, the direct object has the indefinite marker B in front, meaning A or 1. Uh, so we're talking about an indefinite piano. But in 12a, uh, there's no particular piano in mind, right? Ali just wants to rent a piano immediately. And he doesn't care what, it, what piano it is. Right? Whereas in 10, 12b, he has a particular piano in mind, and he wants to rent it immediately. Right? And notice that only in 12b does the direct object get accused of case. In Hebrew, the distinction is one of definiteness rather than specificity. So. Um, uh, in both 13a and 13b, there, there's presumably a particular present in mind, right? Um, but in 13a, that present that present is is new to the discourse. It's just being mentioned for the first time. Whereas in 13b, we're supposed to be able to identify which present it is. Uh, and definiteness in Hebrew is marked by a, a, a definite determiner, ha. And you'll notice here again, the accusative case is only used with the direct object. Uh, something similar, although a little bit more complicated, is going on in Spanish, uh, where direct objects take special marking, in this case the dative preposition a, ah, under certain fairly complicated circumstances. But uh, basically, the basic story is that a direct object is more likely to take a ah if it's high in animacy, so say if it refers to a person rather than a thing, and more likely to take a ah if it's uh, high in specificity, high in definiteness. Uh, so I, I just give a, a single pair of examples of 14 A and B. Um, uh, so I'm looking for my hat versus I'm looking for my friend. And my, my friend is higher in animacy, so it gets uh, this special uh, dative uh, marker. Uh, dative case is also used to mark uh, highly definite or high, and or highly animate direct objects in Hindi as I show in 15. So in 15a, uh, there's no particular fish in mind, right? All I'm saying is that the fisherman you know, went fishing and caught something. Whereas in 15b, there's a particular fish that I have in mind, and I'm telling you that the fisherman caught it. Um, so objects that are high in animacy, high in definiteness, high in specificity tend to get special marking, whereas those that are low in these features um, tend to be treated as sort of less objecty than uh, normal objects. So they can even lose their status as independent arguments in the clause, as independent noun phrases in the clause, and just sort of glom together with the verb. That's a technical term, glom together. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, if you know anything about polysynthetic languages, which I know many of you do, um, you'll know that uh, uh, many of these, in many of these languages, uh, direct objects that are very low in definiteness, definiteness or referentiality tend to incorporate into the verb. And I've got an example from Chakchi. Um, so in 16a, uh, the friend's 
set the net. Here, the direct object is uh, definite. We have a particular net in mind. And it's a separate, independent noun phrase that's getting absolute case marking. Uh, and the subject is getting ergative case marking. In 16b, the friend set nets. Here, we don't have any particular nets in mind. Um, this, we're just sort of describing an, an, an activity. Right? They were net setting. And, and here, net is incorporated into the verb. And they sort of form sort of a complex predicate. And you'll notice that uh, it makes sense not only from a morphological perspective, but from a syntactic perspective to say that the direct object is, shall we say, less of an object in 16b, because you'll notice that here the subject is being marked with absolutive case instead of ergative case. So uh, absolutive case in Chapchi is reserved for subjects of intransitive sentences. So this shows the sentence is formally intransitive. Also, you've got uh, special agreement markers on the verb that distinguish transitive from intransitive sentences. And in 16a, the verb has transitive agreement, and in 16b, it's got intransitive agreement. So, copra net in 16b is not really a, a direct object at all. So, uh, uh, things like definiteness and individuation can uh, affect whether a direct object is really an independent argument or not. Um, now, I think that individuation of the object is connected to things like aspect and tulicity that I talked about in the previous section. Um, and these may be sort of clustered together under a, under a general rubric of effectiveness, uh, although I'm keeping this a deliberately vague notion. But it's a well-known observation that uh, the status of the direct object can affect how, how the event, uh, the sort of features of the event. Uh, we can give an example from English. Uh, 17a and b, Daniel ate the apple versus Daniel ate apples. Here I've varied the number and I've also made the second example indefinite. And you'll notice when you think about it that Daniel ate the apple is telic, so the event necessarily ends once the apple is consumed. But in 17b, there's a, just an indefinite quantity of apples, right? So apple is not really individuated here, and, and therefore there's no necessary end point to the event. Uh, the event of eating apples can go on indefinitely. Right, and I'm going to have an example from Estonian later that shows that other languages use these particles too. So we'll get our Estonian fix for the day. Um, in fact, here come the Estonian examples right away. Um, so you don't have to wait. Um, okay, so uh, I give some examples here of uh, partitive case marking in Estonian. So Estonian is a close relative of Finnish. Um, and direct objects in Estonian, like in Finnish, can take either accusative case or partitive case. And in Estonian, even more than in Finnish, the uh, accusative and the genitive have kind of collapsed together. So I think I've lost uh, the accusative case, accusative slash genitive here. Uh, but I've listed some of the things that partitive case marking is used for. And, and these all go under the rubric of uh, less affected object or less telic uh, predicate. Uh, so partitive case is used if the direct object is indefinite and non-specific, if you don't have any particular uh, object or quantity in mind. Um, so in 18a, we'll have to get some petrol right away. So I just have some indefinite amount of petrol in mind. So partitive case is used for that. In 18b, I show that partitive case is also used on the direct object. Uh, it can also be used on the direct object, even if it's definite. Uh, when the event is ongoing or imperfective. Right? So my friend was packing his things. So he was in the midst of doing it. So the things are not completely affected by the action. Right? Some of them are packed and some of them are not packed at the, at the moment from which the, the new point is taken. Um, in C and D, I show that um, when a verb is non-agentive or stated, um, it's much more likely to assign partitive case to the direct object. And this makes a certain amount of sense from the standpoint of effectiveness, since in a sense, like I saw my friend in the coffee house, my friend isn't necessarily affected by that action. He or she may not even be aware of the action. Right? And uh, if I like the part very much, there arguably isn't even an action at all. Right? This is just denoting a state of affairs. And the park is certainly not being affected by that state, uh, at least under our normal assumptions about parks. Um, <laughs> And then finally, to show that, that things like punctuality and aspect also play a role here, look at the examples in E and F. 
Um, so in uh, sentence E, ta tundis sedanaist. Um, tundis is a, um, a, um, a stative verb to know. So here again, uh, part of the case is preferred. But if you add a special particle, at to the end of the sentence, so this is literally new away, to know away somebody in uh, Estonian is to recognize somebody. So adding this little particle emphasizes the telicity. It makes it into a punctual event. Right? So this is very similar to the Samoan case, except that instead of uh, adding a suffix to the verb, we add a special particle. And notice that this forces the direct object into the uh, accusative slash genitive case, uh, because uh, the uh, uh, event is more punctual. Uh, even though uh, being recognized is arguably not uh, uh, causing you to be affected, but still it's sort of showing that these notions tend to cluster together. All right, so what does this have to do with con language? Or what does this have to do with my con language? Because um, that's what I'm here to talk about, right? Um, okay, so I've, I've been uh, very interested in these sort of non-discriminatory uses of case marking, that is, uses of case marking to, uh, uh, case marking being deputized to uh, express other kinds of grammatical distinctions besides who's doing what to whom. And uh, my particular con line, Tokana, has become something of a laboratory for my uh, uh, understanding of this notion, so I want to share with you uh, some of what I've uh, discovered or been playing around with. Um, Okay, so I've been working on Tokana for about the last 15 years or so. Over that time, it has undergone a tremendous amount of typological shift. Uh, and it would be interesting to, to sort of plot this and see if this is a, a historically plausible progression. But it's gone from being um, a, a head initial dependent marking language, very similar to scare, to now being a head final, uh, a head marking language, uh, more similar to Choctaw or something like that. Um, and uh, all of the pronouns that used to float around independently have gotten sucked into the verb um, as agreement markers. So now the verb is rather heavy with agreement. Uh, but there's still case marking floating around as well. Um, uh, and I want to talk here mostly about core case marking. Uh, uh, to, to, to coin a phrase, uh, Tokana has a healthy amount of case, uh, uh, case marking. Uh, there are uh, uh, seven cases, uh, three core cases I won't talk much about the elite cases. But the core cases I've called, and you'll see soon that these terms are more or less arbitrary, uh, absolute purgative and dative. And I illustrate the, uh, the uses of these cases when they all occur together in the clause in 18a and b. So this is, uh, I'll, I'll read these. Sakyala moi hai alma ino nyokte. Sakyala to tsate pain koma ino et daunte. Uh, these means Sakyal gave the book to the girl and Sakyal put the pot on the table. There's fairly free word order here, but I'm just using the unmarked verb final order in these examples. So you'll see that you see that the, the agent, the, the, the subject, is in ergative case. Uh, the theme uh, is in absolute case, so the thing being put or being given is in absolute case, and the recipient is in dative case. So that looks, you know, pretty similar. Uh, uh, this is basically basket. Um, now, originally, uh, Tokana had a fairly, shall we say, normal case marking system where, where this was basically all that the cases did was uh, mark uh, subjects, objects, and indirect objects. Um, but then, as I began considering the relationship between case marking and, and things like definiteness and event structure, uh, I began to work on the idea of uh, developing a case system that was based not on transitivity, so not on the number of arguments in the clause, but directly on the logic of event structure in the language. And here I'm going to drift uh, rather dangerously for a Chomsky linguist into sort of <laughs> cognitive domains. Um, uh, and uh, sort of see, see what I come up with. You know, how, what would such a language look like if it were taken, so to speak, to extremes? And uh, how naturalistic would it be? Well, I'll leave that to your, uh, to your assessment. But I'll, I'll tell you what I did. So, uh, I basically took the sentences in 18a and b as my model. Um, what, what's the term? My, my schema? Uh, for how case assignment would work in this language. So in 18a and b, uh, uh, the theme, uh, that is the thing being moved from one place to another, is in the absolute case. And it's transmitted from subject.
some source to some goal, right? Where the source in this case is the one uh, carrying out the action, the one initiating the transfer from point A to point B, right? Um, so I decided that I would generalize these functions of the cases and sort of disconnect uh, case marking from uh, its primary discriminatory function and see what happened. So here's the schema that I hit upon. Uh, so ergative case I decided would, would denote the participant that is the source of the action or change of state, usually volitional, but not necessarily. Uh, so typically high in animacy, uh, high in individuation, but uh, not necessarily. Uh, the dative case will denote the goal or end point of a TLIP event. So uh, John mentioned uh, in his talk, why not invent a resultative case? Well, I've done it. Uh, this is the resultative case, uh, except I just call it dative. Um, because you know, I like the, my traditional grammar terms. Okay. Um, and then absolutive would be the elsewhere case, right? So that would denote the participant which is transmitted from a source to a goal, or by extension, the participant that occupies or comes to occupy some location, uh, or that in some way or another mediates between the source and the goal. Um, uh, if you know anything about uh, tata, is it tatani fara or tatari fara? Um, uh, uh, I have no idea. Who knows? Um, uh, turns out to have a very similar case system, although I, it, it was invented independently from mine. So, so my experiments at least show that this is a, a naturalistic conlang in the literal sense that conlangs can naturally evolve this way, but if natural languages can't evolve this way. What was that? I think he uses different terminology too. He does, right. Um, Okay, so the experiment is to see how far I can take this. All right. So if absolute, ergative, and dative case are assigned not based on the number of arguments that the verb has, but on these event structure criteria, then in principle, the two arguments of a monotransitive verb should be able to appear in any of these three combinations, depending on the kind of event that's denoted. Right? And I'll get effects that sort of mimic what we've seen in, in these other natural languages. So in uh, Ditransitives, uh, as I mentioned, data case marks the endpoint of a motion event. So uh, let's generalize this in kind of cognitive uh, linguistics fashion uh, to non-motion events. Um, so <coughs> uh, motion events that have a determined goal are telic, where the goal denotes the endpoint of the event. So uh, let's say that uh, let's generalize denoting the goal to denoting the endpoint of a telic event, whatever kind of telic event it is, whether it involves motion or not. So in, in other words, the marking that's used to express arrival at a location gets metaphorically extended to cover entry into a state. Right? So uh, it's going to follow that the direct object will be marked with dative case in a monotransitive clause, uh, uh, just in case the event uh, is telic and the patient has been completely affected by the action. So the event has been arrived at in the sense that the, the end point has been reached. So the bear ate the fish. That's a telic event, right? The event ends once the fish is gone. So fish will get date of case by extension. The boy smashed the pot. Uh, again, date of case because it's a telic event. Whereas in the sentences in 20, uh, so the woman is carrying the pot or Sakel visited his sister. Uh, these are atelic events, right? So they can't get data case on their direct objects according to the rules, right? So they'll get absolutive case instead. Um, now, since telicity is a property of entire predicates rather than verbs, uh, there's nothing to prevent a verb from taking either data case or uh, uh, absolutive case for its direct object, uh, depending on uh, telicity. So here I'm, I'm sort of mimicking what we've seen in Finnish and Estonian. Uh, so if you look at 21A and B, uh, so here we've got the same subject, same object, but uh, dative case marking in the first case and absolutive in the second case. So al naka hoi means the bear ate the fish. The event is over once the fish is gone. Whereas al naka hoi means the bear ate fish. Um, and uh, you can actually get even less transitive. I didn't include this on the, on the handout, but gahu can actually incorporate or quasi incorporate so you can also get ona in kahuyasit, meaning the bear did some fishing game. Um, okay, so in the first case, the bear ate fish, or sorry, in the bear ate fish, um, uh, the event is open-ended, so no dative marking. In the bear ate the fish, uh, you get uh, uh, dative marking. Um, definiteness is not systematically marked in Tokana, so uh, this 
case marking fulfills a, a somewhat similar function to in languages like uh, uh, Estonian and Finnish, where at least on direct objects, the choice of case marking can be uh, affected by the semantic definiteness. Uh, also in 22 A and B, the fire burned uh, the cloth, so I don't add particles the way English does. Uh, instead, you have a dative case for uh, the fire burned up the cloth, so the cloth is completely consumed, versus uh, absolute case if it's just the fire burned the cloth, made a burn in it, made a hole in it, singed it, whatever. Um, now, what about volitionality of the subject? All right, so if, if ergative case is reserved for subjects that initiate an event, typically agentive subjects, but not necessarily, um, then stative predicates and other kinds of non-eventive predicates uh, should be barred from taking ergative case. So, uh, taking the, the system uh, to its logical extreme, psychological predicates uh, can't take ergative case, so they must take uh, some other case. Uh, following what we've seen in other languages, um, uh, subjects of psych predicates take er uh, oblique cases in Togana. So, uh, in, this is misglossed, uh, as we probably tell. Sakala and Imkwaita means Sakala likes the lean, not Sakala likes me. Sakala likes me with the Sakala Imkwaita. Papaita, sorry. Nobody caught me on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, now, you can also get uh, monotransitive verbs that have an absolutive and a dative, but no ergative argument. Um, so, uh, verbs of motion, necessarily, the absolutive will be the thing undergoing the motion, and the dative will be the, the uh, end point for the motion. So, the women reach the river. Uh, but uh, extending this metaphorically to uh, what you could call figurative motion, that is change of state, uh, the absolutive can mark the uh, thing that is going a change of state and the dative uh, a target state. So the caterpillar turned into a butterfly. Can you um, pronounce your, your word caterpillar? That's fascinating. Like, yeah, so the Y is a, um, a, a non-front, non-low, unrounded vowel. Uh, whose exact realization depends on dialect. And the I that's adjacent to it is a glide, so like which means leaf, uh, uh, leaf slitherer, leaf crawler. Um, okay, and then, uh, and then uh, we can extend this pattern to punctual uh, kinds of events uh, where an individual receives or encounters some sort of object or sensation or idea uh, usually without any premeditation. Uh, and here it's the, the recipient, uh, again, um, extending from the ditransitive construction, the recipient will appear in the data case and the thing being received will be an absolute case. So Sakyal found the books, Sakyal will be in the data case. Uh, the boy heard a loud noise. Uh, so the, the metaphor here is of the sound uh, coming into the ear of the, uh, the boy. So the boy is the end point to of the event. Uh, and the girl got a pair of shoes as well. Um, and then for intransitives, well, we've got three classes, right? So this is somewhat similar to Teana, actually. Um, I believe. Uh, so, uh, except Teana has fewer cases than Teana. Uh, what? It has, it has. It has some. Some cases. Yeah. Um, so for, uh, uh, in 26C, for uh, intransitive verbs that describe some kind of activity, usually carried out volitionally, uh, the subject will be an ergative case. So, playa in hakate, hakata means laugh, I like that, that word. Uh, and it's misglossed, the child died. Uh, it doesn't mean that, it means the child laughed. Um, uh, the child died is in 26B, playa in kyoge. Um, so here, the child is not controlling the action, but uh, is undergoing the action, and the event is tilik, right? The, the event is over once the child is dead. Okay? So uh, here we get uh, a dative case on the subject. Uh, and then uh, basically all other intransitives, those that denote states or locations or uh, motion, uh, take absolute subjects as if by the way uh, uh, the child is sitting down. Um, and uh, uh, I, I noted above that uh, 
metaphorically extending from spatial to non-spatial domains, we get arrival at a location linking up with entry into a state or dative case, applying that same extension to the absolutive case. So absolutive case is used to mark objects that are at a location. Therefore, it should also be used to mark things that are in a particular state, occupying a particular state of being. So absolutive case is also used for subjects of stative intransitive verbs, like in 27, by Ihan, the child is young. Um, uh, and then we get into all sorts of fun stuff, where, where um, uh, derivation and inflectional morphology interacts with case marking in very dynamic ways. Um, so if you compare 28A and B, uh, so in 28A we have a state of verb, sokna, which means to be in darkness, uh, to be not illuminated. Um, and uh, here, this, and being a state of verb, it takes an absolutive subject, halu ek sokna, the room was dark. But if you take sokna and um, uh, add the suffix al to it, you get a telic change of state verb, soknala, meaning to come into darkness, to descend into darkness, to become dark. Uh, that's a telic change of state verb, so now the uh, subject is going to go into the native case. Um, you can see how this would be a bitch to learn for somebody who's <laughs> not used to languages with lots of case markings, but I think it's fine. Okay, so some further consequences, and here's where I, I, I think I'm getting into uh, interesting uh, territory where some of what I've done is not attested in any natural language that I know of, but that I would expect to find in some natural language or other if, uh, if what I'm doing is, is naturalistic in any way at all. Um, so take a look at the sentences in 29. Uh, the boy pushed the stone versus the boy pushed the stone into the ditch. So here we see, uh, again, that telicity is a property of predicates and not of verbs, um, or even of verb phrases, maybe. Uh, so the boy pushed the stone is atelic, there's no endpoint, but the boy pushed the stone into the ditch necessarily ends once the stone is in the ditch. I mean, he can keep pushing it around, but he has ceased to push it into the ditch once it's in the ditch. So would that same kind of thing apply back to your 26A on the child sitting down if you added a clause in the chair? You sat down in the chair? Oh, and in 26A, um, this means, this chair, means, like this means sit as in being in a sitting position. Oh. Uh, sit down is a, different, is a different verb. And if you sat down on a chair, a chair would be in the data. Um, so, uh, since, so what we're doing in 29A and B is we're taking an at like predicate and providing it with an endpoint and thereby making it t-like. Uh, so if data case marks endpoints in Tokana, then necessarily into the ditch, the equivalent of into the ditch is going to be in the data case in Tokana. So I've got the sentences in 30A and 30B where I've just added the data case uh, marked uh, down ditch to the second sentence. Um, Likewise, and here's where things get even uh, get uh, even less intuitive, but I think more interesting. Um, compare the sentences in 30A through D. So 30A is the same AT like sentence, the boy pushed the stone. In 30B, C, and D, I've added um, measure phrases or, or culmination phrases uh, to this. So uh, my intuition is that the boy pushed the stone is AT like, but the boy pushed the stone seven feet is T like. I mean, that event necessarily ends once you reach the seven foot mark, right? You can continue pushing the stone, but you will have ceased to push it seven feet at that point. Likewise, uh, uh, you can add a temporal measure phrase to close off an at like event and make it t -lick. So the boy pushed the stone for two hours. Again, that event necessarily ends once the two hour mark is reached. And the boy pushed the stone until he got tired. The becoming tired uh, point marks the end point. Um, so, uh, um, here the sentence doesn't include um, a goal phrase, um, but rather a phrase that indicates some sort of spatio-temporal limit, right? Well, suppose we extend uh, the function of the data case uh, so, such that it marks not just goals and not just, uh, and we don't just generalize it to the endpoints of TLIC events, but also uh, to phrases that delimit an event, thereby making it TLIC. Uh, so, 
Uh, so we've you know, extended it further, and now we've got a way of expressing things like seven feet or four two hours or until one gets tired. And until found we just add data case marking. So uh, we've got Igala, Nakakatlan, and Te, Initanga. Tokana speakers don't use uh, uh, our units of measurement, so I had to change it to the boy pushed the stone three cubits. Katlan um, is, is the, the distance from the tip of your middle finger to your elbow. Video um, surprise. What was that? Idiosyncratically? Uh, yeah, everybody's cut down is different. <laughs> um, 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 although it's a matriarchal society, so maybe the, the, the distance from the middle finger to the elbow of the oldest woman in the village would be the standard of measure or something like that. Um, okay, so here the boy pushed the stone three cubits. Three cubits is in the dative case. Uh, the boy pushed the stone for two hours. Two hours is in and the boy pushed the stone until he got tired. So in Tokana, um, there's, no, um, uh, there's no way to do embedded clauses. You have to nominalize, uh, like in many uh, for final languages. And so what we've got here is uh, the boy pushed the stone to his tired becoming, to his becoming tired. Um, so metaphorically, uh, the data phrase expresses an abstract endpoint. It, it measures the distance between the source and the goal, or the source and the end point. Right? So there's a, a two hour distance between the beginning of the event and the end of the event in the case of 32B. Right? So uh, because it identifies the end point, two hours uh, gives the data case there. Um, now, I know of some natural languages that mark some of these things using data case, but I don't know of any natural languages that mark all of these things. Uh, in a consistent way using native case. Uh, uh, but it, I would predict that such a language might occur. Right? And here's sort of um, where you know I switch back and forth between my Conlanger hat and my linguist hat. Right? <laughs> this is a nice example of how I think playing around with conlangs and trying to figure out how would, how would it work if you extended such an idea in a particular direction as far as it would go, uh, gives us some interesting things to think about in terms of doing the search on natural language. Um, so a lot of this conference has been about how can linguistics help you with your conlanging. This is a little bit to end off with about how conlanging might be able to help us do linguistics. Um, now, this, my schema similarly suggests various different kinds of extensions for the absoluted case. So I mentioned that uh, before that your canonical transitive sentence in Tokana, uh, where you've got an agentive subject and a patientive uh, direct object, uh, that undergoes a change of state and the event ends once it the, the, uh, culminates in that state. Uh, those kinds of predicates take an ergative subject and a dative object. Uh, well, uh, that leaves us with an absolute case left over, right? So, that, uh, so because the dative case is being used for the direct object, the normal case for direct objects, the, the absolute is then thereby freed up to express other kinds of things, right? So what kinds of things could it express? Well, again, going back to uh, ditransitive construction, so uh, in a sentence like uh, the boy gave the book to the girl, the book is going to be in the, case, uh, in the absolutive case. Uh, and that sort of event involves a transmission from uh, a beginning point to an end point. Right? So you can almost think of the book as mediating between the source and the goal. Right? It's the thing that bridges the distance between the source and the goal. So I thought, uh, how might I extend this idea of bridging between a source and a goal? to other kinds of events that don't involve emotion. Uh, well, one kind of bridge between, say, an agent and a patient is, um, uh, so in an event of, say, smashing a vase with a hammer, right, if you think about it, the, the agent is the one who initiates the action, and the, the thing being smashed undergoes the action, but it's really the hammer that carries out the action itself. Right? Uh, so I smash the pot with the hammer. I'm doing something to the hammer, and the hammer is doing something to the result of that, right? Um, and um, so you can think about the hammer as mediating between me between me and my goal, namely to get that pot smashed, right? Um, okay, so if ab absolute case is used for mediators between sources and goals, why not use it to mark instruments of telic predicates, right? So the woman killed the fish with a harpoon uh, gives us uh, the construction we see in 33A, uh, where fish is in the dative, and harpoon is in the absolute. 
And what I think is interesting about this is, is um, so here uh, uh, the, app, the instrument is, in some sense, the, um, the, the, the most closely associated element with the verb. Uh, it's, um, it's in the absolute case. It must appear adjacent to the verb. In certain cases, it can incorporate into the verb. And I think there are echoes of this in, in natural languages where, where uh, it's quite common for um, uh, uh, verbal predicates to be derived from instrumental nouns, for example. So I hammered the metal, for instance, um, or I knifed him in the back. Right? And um, so I could see this construction that I have in Tokana having uh, Natlang uh, uh, parallels in, in that kind of uh, behavior. Uh, and also in 33b, uh, uh, Eileen covered the table with a cloth. Here, a cloth is not sort of uh, prototypically what we think of as an instrument, but it is sort of mediating between the person doing the action and the goal, which is to cover the table. Um, okay, and then some more examples uh, that I'll go through very quickly because I'm out of time. Um, in 34a, the woman shaped a pot out of clay, or the woman shaped clay into a pot. Here we get, even in English, uh, a nice extension of the spatial metaphor. Uh, so here the absolutive thing marks the substance out of which something is made, or which is made into something. Right? Um, uh, he built his house out of wood. Uh, so a more literal translation of 34b into English would be something like, um, he made wood into his house, or he made he made wood to his house. Okay? Um, and 34C, he pounded the corn into flour. Okay? Um, and then finally, um, so I was talking about measure phrases earlier. Earlier, there are actually at least two kinds of temporal measure phrases in languages like uh, uh, English. I think these two types of phrases are basically universal. So in 35A, we've taken a um, Telic predicate. He built the house. And in 35B, added a measure phrase to it. Uh, but notice that here the measure phrase doesn't uh, delimit the event in as much as it, it uh, tells us the amount of time that we should measure out to the end point of the event. But rather, it sort of measures the space in between the beginning of the event and the end point of the event. Right? So he built the house in four months means that from the, from the time he started building until the house was finished, until the end point was reached, four months passed. He didn't so, have four months to build a house. What was that? He didn't have four months to build a house. It just so happened that he took four months. Well, it could, yeah. it could be either. Okay. Yeah. Um, four months is the amount of time uh, in between the source and the goal. Um, so I thought, okay, well, uh, if, um, if absolutive case is used to mediate between sources and goals, why not extend that to phrases that measure the distance in time or space between a source and a goal. So in Tokana, the way you express he built the house in four months is with house in the dative case and four months in the absolutive case. So this is sort of the inverse of the he pushed the stone for three hours construction where the measure phrase is in the dative case and the thing being manipulated is, is in the absolutive case. Um, okay, so uh, just to wrap up, I, I started by uh, discussing uh, some of the ways in which uh, lang natural languages deploy case marking for things other than merely distinguishing subjects from objects or direct from indirect objects or what have you. Um, and then I shared with you some of my explorations of uh, uh, sort of taking as many of these interesting uh, other things that case marking can do and uh, working them into my timeline uh, in a way such that case marking uh, comes to be used primarily to mark uh, uh, the status of a participant in an event rather than the number of arguments that there are in an event. And sort of as a side note to that, um, in as much as I am taking phenomena from natural languages and sort of marrying them with each other, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm taking my source material from life, um, uh, it would be interesting to see whether the kind of system that I've cooked up uh, has any direct parallels in, in uh, any other, any naturally occurring languages. I sort of predict that, uh, that it would. And uh, um, even if it doesn't, uh, the mere fact of trying to solve the problem of case marking in Tokana, I think, 
has given me a better understanding of how event structure works, of the nature of telicity and, and the various ways in which it expresses itself, the nature of agentivity and the ways it expresses itself, and has therefore led me, I think, to a deeper understanding of how natural languages work. Thank you. So, please join me in a round of applause for all of our speakers. Um, I'm glad you could all make it. Um, please remember to get all three pages of the feedback form, fill them out, give them to me. Um, if you have further questions, come with us and let's talk, um, discuss them over Chinese food. Um, right now, we need to clean up and get out of here because we are going to get kicked out in a few minutes. Thank you all. See you later.